join me in welcoming our distinguished panel as they discuss prioritizing value over return in human health. So on the chair, we have Dr. Lars Hardingstein, co-leader of McKenzie Health Institute. We've got Dr. Joanna Holbrook, Chief Scientific Officer of Cambridge Epigenetic Epigenetics. Victor Nevuda, Senior Director of MRL UK Discovery, MSD. And Professor Nadim Sawar, Global Head of Genomics and DTX Strategies. So welcome. First of all, isn't it great to be all in person again? It's just amazing. I mean, for, after so many virtual events, uh, it's just great that these things happen again this year. So my name is Lars Hartenstein. I'm the co-leader of the McKinsey Health Institute. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the McKinsey Health Institute is a non-profit generating entity within McKinsey. And our aspiration is to catalyze action globally that leads to material improvement in health across communities, uh, sectors, and geographies. And today, the topic of our uh, call today is basically prioritizing value over return in human health. I believe I've been asked to chair uh, this panel because for many years I've been looking at this question from many different angles, from life sciences, from how the government thinks about it, as well as in global health, how we're translating innovation also, also to low middle income countries. So um, before um, I go further, I'd just like to ask our panel lists to briefly introduce themselves um, and then we go into the details and the questions. Joe, why don't you start? Hi, um, I'm Jo. Um, I'm a scientist, I think not just by job description, but probably by personality as well. <laughs> I was a dinosaur obsessive as a kid. Um, I believe in objectivity. Um, and I, um, I started my career in biomedical science. Unlike Lars, I think I have been thinking about value more implicitly. I wanted to discover stuff because it's cool. Um, and that stuff that was new at the beginning of my career and probably stuff that is useful um, as I've got older. Um, and I've seen the companies and entities that I've worked for as vehicles for doing good work and having value. Um, and the returns are sort of justifying of my existence. When I'm feeling grumpy, I call it justifying my existence. Because mm -hmm. every job you do, you have to justify your existence a bit. So um, when I worked at university, it was writing grants and finding alignment between what was getting funded and what I wanted to do. When I worked for Big Pharma, it was um, making product, making medicines and getting on market and for me companion diagnostics um, and now I work in biotech and similarly I have to explain to investors why they should be investing in this and we're just in the company I work for now getting product to market so again selling um, as a way of justifying doing the value um, I've always I've always said I don't want to spend the majority of my time justifying my existence but that balance <laughs> um, between creating uh, return um, and creating value is something that I think has been an implicit conflict all through my career. So I'm really interested to hear thoughts today. Great. Thank you. Well, we'll definitely get to that later. So then we have Nadim Sawar. Thanks, Lars. Hi, everyone. I'm Nadim. Uh, I'm interested in business models at the intersection of human biology, uh, digital and data sciences, uh, and investment models uh, to launch uh, products that help people live longer, better lives. Uh, before I get into me, I just wanted to recognize what the organizers have done today. I was mentioning earlier, I've spoken on panels organized by companies whose exclusive job it is to run um, panels like this. And you guys have kicked their ass in terms of organizational skills <laughs> and, and diversity and everything else. So well done to, to you guys. I'm also a scientist, first and foremost. I'm a proud alumnus of the School of Clinical Medicine, University of Cambridge. Is Queen's College in the house? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was planted. <laughs> I'm an epidemiologist by training, uh, before epidemiology became cool, by the way. 
Um, <laughs> everyone is an epidemiologist today, I think. Um, and then I got interested in things you can measure in large numbers of people, which included genomics, omics, and other things. And then how that can help make medicines. Uh, I had a lab, I got tenure, and then I swapped Cambridge UK for Cambridge US, uh, academia uh, for industry, um, Brexit for Trump, uh, and many, <laughs> many other things. Um, I was at a big pharma company to begin with, and then eventually I uh, launched a, I was the founder and president of a biotech company. Uh, that was funded by 120 million um, investment from Azi, uh, which focused on using human genetics to make medicines. So our focus was how can you use knowledge you get from human genetics to discover and deliver new medicines. And we brought medicines uh, into clinical trials for autoimmune diseases, immuno-oncology, uh, COVID, and hopefully now a newer generation. Uh, recently, I've swapped back um, from the US back to the UK. Uh, I am now living in Edinburgh, and I'm an, I'm an honorary professor at the university there. And I'm now interested in how can we use data and digital technologies to help people live longer, better lives. After your glorious record, I now wonder what it means for global politics that you <laughs> came back from the US to the UK. <laughs> yeah. Especially today. Exactly. <laughs> so, and finally, Victor Nevuda. Thanks, Lars. Uh, so I'm a group leader, I'm leading an integrative genomics uh, group in uh, MSD uh, in London. Um, I'm also a scientist, as both our uh, other panelists, uh, and I always um, have this conflict as well, with what is the value and how we generate value. I've, uh, I've been academic for a long time and I looked at how nature works and I was very, very curious to understand and, and, and learn more from it. Uh, so curiosity was my, my biggest driver, but somewhere inside I was also looking at finding translation and how we can contribute and what we can do. And I remember uh, being in, in, my, uh, in my chemistry and uh, rotating proteins and seeing this is really nice to have a drug which changes the function and helps, helps people. So um, I had a lot of uh, kind of different reasons to move into, into, into drug discovery. And uh, eventually I made a jump in, into the biotech and I worked and I uh, was a, a kind of um, one of the uh, founders of the biotech. We, we worked for some time and um, of course there's a, it's a complex, uh, complex world and so the, the, the place that we worked did not work as well as uh, some of the other biotechs. And then eventually I went back into the academia and I continued work and I became an academic in Edinburgh. Uh, but still this nagging feeling of um, doing something, uh, kind of not just publishing papers, was really strong. And eventually I moved to, to work for Pharma and I led a group in, in GSK, uh, working on the early stage projects and late stage projects. And one of the uh, really nice feelings and one of the most successful projects were those which actually made it in a clinic. So although I kind of was a recent newcomer into the Pharma, I had actually two pro two products into the market in, in GSK. And it was a really nice feeling to have the patients coming and saying that you personally help them. Those were the cell and gene therapy products. So those were kind of very, very rare diseases. But it was really nice to see the parents coming and, and shaking your, your, kind of your, your hand. And it was really added some additional value. So not only doing and discovering what nature is good for, but you're actually doing something which is, which is helping people. And then I've, uh, I moved to um, working on diseases of aging and neurodegeneration. And this is what I'm doing now at um, MSD. So now we're really developing some, because there was really unmet, a lot of unmet need in, in the population now. And, and, and this as well leads to the, what is the valuable for, 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 the, for, the, for the population? What diseases we actually need to treat to, to make people because uh, I think you also need to think uh, how you distribute your, your efforts. You cannot discover everything. So you need to focus on, on something. And this is of aging, it's probably one of the biggest uh, coming problem for the, for the humanity. Mm -hmm. how, we, how we support all those aging population, how we do it so it doesn't put additional burden to the, to the younger generation. And giving people healthier life, I think it's for the longer. We're not talking about magic pill which makes people live forever, but Giving people a healthier life, I think it's really, really meaningful. And I, I really glad to be involved in, in, in this effort. So we, again, we're doing a lot of early stage projects and as well late stage projects. And I'm working across different, um, uh, different geographies. So I'm here really would like to have a better understanding of what other people think about uh, how we're generating value and, 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 and beyond for what we do. Thanks.
Thanks for these introductions. So now let me tee up the topic a bit because it's a vast topic. So we'd like to center it a bit around three guiding questions. The first, of, the first is, how does our definition of value actually drive how we innovate? I'll talk more about that in a second. The second one is, how can we innovate even quicker? Also with the experience now of what happened uh, during COVID-19. And then thirdly, how can we ensure fair and equitable access um, to new innovations? So now the first one, what's the definition of value? Just two aspects I'd like to highlight. First of all, we predominantly define val health value normally in terms of diseases. However, people mostly think about their health in terms of function, not necessarily linked to a disease. Uh, I'm going to cite some recent research that we actually did for 20,000 um, people randomly selected around the world in 20 countries. And what we found is that there's actually a fair amount of folks that say they're not in very good health, even though um, they have a disease, and there are people who believe they're not in very good health functionally, even though um, they have no disease. So first of all, the linkage, be, do we need to define, is it prop, appropriate to define health in terms of disease or the absence of disease? Also very relevant in what, terms of what you just said, in terms of aging, right? Because aging is not necessarily well understood in terms of disease only. Then the second aspect is, what are really the constitutive parts of health? So if we look at PubMed or any, any database, typically the research is, or the endpoints are 80% in terms of physical health. But when you ask people how they actually think about their own health, what comes first is their mental health. Then of course physical health and also social and spiritual health that are all aspects of health that people are valuing. However, in terms of how we define value, physical health is normally the starting point. Let me just say, without getting too much into it, but spiritual health, of course, understood in terms of purpose and belonging, not linked at all to any uh, particular religious, religious affiliation or so. So those are, the, so, so basically, what are we solving to, for in terms of our definition of health? How can we innovate even quicker? And thirdly, uh, how can we solve for equity, a fair equity, uh, equitable access? So with this, I'd like to go back to this distinguished panel uh, with a few questions. And maybe, Nadim, we start with you. Um, how do you personally think about you know, health value and um, how does a traditional disease-based uh, perspective on value support or inhibit valuation in the areas that you have been working in? Thanks, Lars. So I think the biopharmaceutical sector in its current form will cease to exist within our generation. And I think if you guys choose to work in the biopharmaceutical sector, there won't be one. Uh, instead, there will be a health solution sector. I think the patients and the people will demand products that help people live longer, better lives. One component of those products will, of course, be biopharmaceuticals. But there's a whole other suite of products that can help people live longer, better lives. Digital, um, diagnostic, predictive, societal, uh, dietary, uh, and, and, and everything else. So I expect that will be a fundamental change that happens in our sector. How do we flip it around and start making anything that can help people live longer, better lives while still delivering value? The other thing that I think will change fundamentally is the way we've been making medicines for the last few decades has been a little bit back to front. We typically start with, well, what do payers and regulators want? Uh, because if we make something no one pays us for, it doesn't matter. Uh, and how will a regulator, the FDA or whoever, approve it? And then based upon that starting point, then back calculate, well, what is the clinical trial I need to do to fulfill that regulator's requirement? And then what is the science I need to do to deliver a product for that clinical trial? And then who is the patient that's going to receive my product? I think going forward, it'll be flipped. Uh, we'll start with a patient or a person and think about, well, what does this patient or person want? What is the science that delivers what they want? What is the clinical trial that can demonstrate that? And how do I monetize that? So I strongly anticipate, if any of you hope to make um, health solutions, and I really hope all of you do, the way you'll do it will be fundamentally different to the way we've done it. 
fascinating. That's a little bit like demand backwards kind of. So, so <laughs> science scientists sometimes thinks the other way around, of course, right? So um, that gets us a little bit to the innovation process. And maybe Victor, so in terms of your perspective on what can we take from the COVID experience into the R&D process from beginning to end? Many orthodoxies on the regulatory side have also on the collaboration side have been broken. Um, that may be a little bit more on the standard bi biopharmaceutical industry. So, but like, how do you see this mm. leading to potential acceleration also in other mm. fields? Yeah, it's an interesting one. Uh, and, and yes, um, we had this discussion as well uh, internally. Yeah, there seems to be no going back from what when we had the COVID. Uh, it means everything will, will change and everything will be different. And of course it will. It will impact how people think and how people, where they imagine uh, what is possible. However, we need to, uh, there are two things we need to realize. First of all, COVID vaccines are not coming from completely naive uh, area. Uh, those vaccines have been worked on uh, long. For mRNA vaccines have been developed by, by multiple uh, partners, and they just happen to be working uh, quite well, reasonably well for, uh, for acute COVID. Uh, now, uh, of course, I think uh, how it's all kind of collaboration developed, how things worked uh, is very important precedent. And it would be used as an example, as we're using in this panel, it would be used in other contexts, as well in the discussion with regulator. So it's definitely possible that things will change, but I think I believe it will change gradually. There will be, of course, more freedom in how we, we work, and there's a lot of different models have been explored in working with regulators and working together between different farmers. And it's not completely novel. I think it's just uh, COVID been a very, very good case when things just worked quite nicely. So I, I think uh, this will be, I believe it will be, it will facilitate a lot of those discussions. And people like yourself will start thinking about how this is done and it's definitely possible. So I think it will definitely change, but I would not say that it will change dramatically in every, every area. COVID was just a, was the, was a kind of one, one off in, in terms of, of, of the development. In many other areas, we not have as successful tools for, for treating the disease. And I think it will take us longer. And I would say that we still need to go back and understand better the disease and have a really good foundations. This will help us to develop vaccines and develop other products as fast as we've done for, uh, for, for COVID. So I think having this good basis, maybe it's scientists and me talking, but having this good basis, good understanding in different disease and being ready for the right constellations to move on faster will probably be very important. It will, of course, will happen more in uh, now in infectious diseases, as importance of it rise now to the top, but I think it will be relevant as well in, in other areas. And I think it's importantly for, for all those rare diseases, I'm talking about, about personalized health, for all those uh, cell and gene therapies, we do need to shorten cycles. Things need to be significantly shorter and much more economical for those treatments to become um, useful and much broader uh, spread. I think you all heard the uh, presentation by uh, Jell uh, yesterday. There is a many different rare diseases and we are maybe getting better and diagnosing those diseases, but getting treatments are a different story. So getting those 7,000 diseases treated would be very difficult uh, economically for actually in terms of the value for the population. So getting those cycles short and using uh, COVID as an example mm -hmm. would, be, would be, I think, wise way of, of moving forward and speeding up the process. Mm -hmm. So two different perspectives on where the value is coming from, of course, potentially synergistic, you know. One starting patient-centric with a solution in some ways and here grounded in deep disease understanding and with mm -hmm. greater speed getting from that into the clinic and driving innovation that way, a little bit more grounded in the success story of, of bio, biopharmaceuticals. So now, Joe, you've been looking at machine learning uh, a lot. So what a role does that play at, and potentially intermediate between those two factors yeah. to really see where the most value is? It's going to help both. Um, so as Nadine was talking about, if you're going to start with the individual, um, you need machine learning to make sense of the complexity of the information. When I started in drug discovery, we were reductionists. We 
took a list of symptoms that didn't necessarily have the same molecular cause, um, reduced it to a disease process which we modelled in the mouse, tried to treat the mouse, and then extrapolated that back up to the whole human population. Um, it worked to some extent, but it could be a lot better. Um, what we could do now is study the individual, um, collect information about them. So it started with genetics. We started with predisposition to disease from what we inherit. We know that that's not all of it. All of us are a product not just of what we inherit, but the environment we're in, um, our social standing, our social support, our lifestyle. Um, that is also encoded in multiomic data. Um, it's encoded in your epigenome, and it's also encoded in the data we collect about ourselves. Um, putting all those together will allow us to start with the patient, understand the processes underneath it, um, and create better drugs. So we need machine learning to deal with that complexity, to integrate that data around individuals. Um, it'll also speed up getting to therapies, um, and I know Victor's built some of this, um, we need platforms to do it. If you have an individualised uh, picture of disease or of health, then to intervene in that you need platforms that are flexible um, where you can push in that data and push out treatments. And we've started to do this with things like cell therapy and gene therapy where you, you could CRISPR any kind of cassette. Um, that will become more common. We do it now with creation of compounds, um, and so machine learning will enable that kind of platform for healthcare where we actually do get individualised treatments. Just one question, just following up on this, yeah. like also machine learning, you mentioned the patient, right? How does one make sure that the algorithms, so to speak, are equitable and fair? Because the innovation process is obviously driven by information that one has about the patients and the set of information that you feed it is obviously therefore leading Yes. So informing the innovation process. Absolutely. And, and this is a huge problem. It's really more of an economic problem. So we've already seen this, that if we start with the payers and what you can get paid for, you end up collecting data from rich white men. Um, and that's sort of okay for rich white men because you get an information about, um, so for instance, atherosclerosis, which is common in rich white men. You collect a lot of data on that. Um, it's not great for all of the excluded groups. They get the trickle down of those drugs. It's better than getting a drug made for a mouse. Um, at least it's made for a human, but you will get more adverse events. It won't work as well. Um, so what we need to incentivize is diverse data collection. Um, that's good for everyone. Um, and actually, I think that's quite an easy argument to win. You can incentivize capitalist entities, big companies, by regulating. And of course, we need to do that. And now, um, many countries um, require trials in, in the local population for approval. You can do it by incentivizing with public money. So we do that through our universities. Um, but you can also do it by showing that it helps your bottom line. And actually, it helps your bottom line, not just through consumer power, um, when people require companies to act um, ethically. But actually, it's better for the science because science works by contrasts. So actually, looking at a population who are relatively resistant to atherosclerosis versus a population that are um, susceptible is going to get you more um, useful scientific contrast than just picking one thing. Um, and we're seeing that across GWAS, certainly, as um, we're starting to get more diverse um, data collection. I One uh, axis I personally think is really important, We've, we're starting to tackle too late, ethnicity and gender, um, we also need to tackle social economic status because that affects everything. And when I started working with epidemiologists, I was really shocked by the fact that we had to, every linear regression we ever ran, we had to control for social economic status because that actually explains almost all health, health outcomes on its own. And we certainly see that it massively affects um, health outcomes across the board. Um, so data collection has to address that. What is it about maternal education or household income or postcode um, that, or status in the world, how, how much respect your job gets that affects your health outcomes? Because we know it has a massive effect. Um, and I hope that data collection will be more diverse, not just because it's the right thing to do, but actually it makes sense for the bottom line. It's an easy, that's an easy argument to make. Mm -hmm. No, thanks. Very important topic. Let me just stay with fair and equitable access for a moment. And Nadim, you have been looking a lot at 
you know, digital applications also together with omics-based applications. How do you see the equity and access challenge there? Yeah, just first of all, building on something that Joe said that I think is, is fundamental. Um, if you wanted, from a straight up return on investment perspective, the maximum bang for your buck, and you were gonna generate some new omic data, mm -hmm. the least efficient population you could study is the predominant population where the vast majority of our current omic data comes from, which is you know wealthy, predominantly white populations. Um, it is statistically proven that you're 25 times more likely to find a novel genetic association by studying a South Asian or an African or some other population. So straight up finance, if you have yep. a certain amount of money and you wanna invest it, to discover something new, think about where to invest it and what's the return on that investment. There's some great case studies. That, uh, poster child for genetically guided medicines is a drug for lowering cholesterol called PCSK9. The way this drug came about was a single person who was a human knockout for PCSK9 couldn't make any PCSK9 was discovered. And it turns out if you can't make any PCSK9, you have extremely low levels of cholesterol. And that led to the idea, well, if a human knockout for PCSK9 can't make, uh, has very low cholesterol, can a drug that inhibits PCSK9 achieve the same? Long story short, it can. Um, this singular person was an African-American lady in Texas. So she herself contained that much innovative knowledge that she could drive the discovery of a whole new class of medicine, including one that could be curative. So there are currently gene therapies, again, PCSK9, to cure a genetic disease. So that's the value of the data that came from this one individual. And I believe she was actually erroneously added to the trial. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, so think about the the value you could generate, straight up dollars, the value you could generate by unearthing such people around the globe. And what is a scalable mechanism to, to do that? So that's one opportunity for value, is from the data you can generate. And then think about the value you can generate by keeping people healthy. If you think about the last time, so in the UK we have the NHS, which stands for the National Health Service. If any of you live in the UK, when was the last time you interacted with the NHS to think about your health? Probably never. You usually interact with the NHS to think about your sickness or your disease. It's very rare to interact, at least at your age, with the NHS to think about your health. And that's typically the case in the vast majority of medical systems. Uh, we don't incentivize people to think about their health. If we did, we could save a heck of a lot of money. Um, so if there was a way to develop products and interventions that can keep people healthy, that could be very sustainable. And I believe you know, digital technologies, societal interventions, um, dietary and physical activity and sleep-based and other interventions, in addition to biopharmaceutical interventions, I think have a, a huge role to play. Yeah. And we, the technology is starting to be there. We're starting to see aging as almost a programmed obsolescence. Um, a bit like your iPhones, we seem to have a, uh, epigenetic changes that happen over the years. The work from people like Steve Holbeth has shown that, that this isn't just a random collection of um, mistakes that happen as you age. This is something that is programmed in. Um, and hence, we have start having technological ways to intervene, which is, again, easy argument for private finance mm. and for public good finance to get involved. But yeah. maybe just to add to all those, to, there's already active programs and projects ongoing in this space. So I think also we need to spread them more. But for example, there is a already a very mature programs in, for example, uh, East Asia, British East Asians, uh, which are very uh, consanguineous population of, of people living in, in East London. And there is a, uh, we are involved in profiling uh, those, those individuals to understand human knockouts and to understand how they both influence this um, uh, not before profiled population that much, but also to, to, to add to the body of knowledge for the disease. And of course, we're focusing on some of the diseases, cardio, cardio and metabolic diseases, which are important for this. But I believe we will have a lot of different discoveries. We have already seen cases where some uh, specific targets been uh, knocked out in this population. And the company, for example, might have a, a drug to inhibit this specific uh, target. And you can see how safe is this in the context of, of, of the really true organism. 
which is, which is human. So I think there is already a lot of thinking goals there, but I think what's important to generating value if it is a trust, trust of people to give this data for the greater good, trust to, to share this data and how we're making them feel that they are included and, and then getting value back in return. So we're also involved in one large uh, project, which is the, uh, a key project of the um, life science strategy in the UK. And just let me to say that the UK is actually leading uh, probably a player in the, in the, in the, human, uh, in the human genetics in, in the world. Uh, of course, there's uh, other more emerging um, economies like China is coming, but I think in the UK, uh, there's a lot of longitudinal data based on the, on, on the NHS. And so this OFH, uh, our future health cohort, is involved in very large profiling which is very important because I think the genetic cohort that we looked before were, of course, of a limited size. Mm -hmm. Like UK Biobank was a very important project to understand what we can discover and to hone the tools, but it was only half a million. Now, in these newer uh, uh, projects, which are in the many millions, five million strong, I think I, we believe we will get much better understanding, the baseline understanding of, of, of human health. Because we all this often jump into the disease without really understanding what is the really baseline looks like, how health should look like. And I think look at this in longitudinal sense uh, to understand not only what causes disease, but how diseases are progressing. So both by markers prog of progression and nodal points where we can influence disease progression. This, of course, will take time. But I think with getting this data in place, including multi-omics, and, and getting this data of high quality, then I think that tools like machine learning and any other statistical approaches will really help us to, to surface the important signals. So I think the process of value generation should be kind of focusing on making this process smoother and maybe giving it some time to, to mature. What's great about those? I mean, I sort of kind of tee up a couple of things because we have spoken about, you know, non-disease-based approaches, um, you spoke, Nadim, you spoke a lot about essentially prevention and promotion as opposed to curing diseases. I'm just going to kind of share just one statistic. The, if you just look at the OECD, health systems spend about 2.8% of their budgets on promotion and prevention. So the vast majority of it is actually disease-based. So whereas here is a panel where with different perspectives, there's a lot of belief in that a lot of the values actually potentially non-disease-based approaches. So that is an inherent tension that we have. So I would say, argue also we have in the innovation process where the incentives are very much through disease-based channels versus on the other hand, you know, much of the value um, uh, comes through other areas. And I was wondering, and I, I come back to you, Joe, in a second. I just want to quickly follow up because you mentioned in your intro also that you looked a lot of aging. Mm. Um, and I wonder whether many of those challenges actually coming together there, in some ways, the lead market there are old white men in some ways, uh, on some level also. So, so there's an equity and access issue and has very long lead times. And as opposed to, let's say, the return profiles of oncology innovation, yeah. some of this is quite tricky. So how do you find this playing out? And are we investing enough in that particular area, for example? Uh, yeah, so I completely agree your, your very poignant point about how we're treating those long uh, and not necessarily well-defined state. Uh, I think it will, I think it's important to think about this in the long term, <laughs> is after all the disease <laughs> of aging, uh, because I think a lot of things will need to mature both our, our regulatory landscape will need to mature and our comfort in getting um, safe treatments for, because I think it has to be safe, but getting something, uh, safe treatments for a long time. I think it's also, uh, it will definitely take time, the trials will be long, but I think we need just, we'll see the population is aging, and people would need to, to have this. So I agree that we don't need to, I mean, it's, it's easier to say that we should uh, innovate, but I think it would also be very difficult in practice to cut corners. I think we will have to think about this tactically, where we can cut corners and do it in multiple different, multiple different ways. And this will speed up the process. But we cannot just say, that, yes, now we'll come up with some magic instance that people will take from age of 20 and do it systematically every day. 
So I think we need to be, we need to be pragmatic as well. And I think uh, being this pragmatic, what we think about diseases of aging is to define what are the most important hallmarks of aging and try to, 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 to distill this and crystallize it to a specific, specific diseases to then help aging population in specific. So yes, it would be personalized, it wouldn't fit everyone, but I think gradually it, it will come, it will actually probably go the full cycle to having something as a health, uh, healthier lifestyle. And healthier lifestyle, not only promoted by kind of uh, <laughs> snake oil um, uh, doctors, but also promoted by the industry and promoted by, by society. So I think it will, it will, it will definitely will go this way, and it will, it will mature. Yeah. And novel patient-centric solutions, I suppose, yeah. uh, or not patient because they're not patients exactly. at the time necessarily. Joe, you had a comment for. Oh, I was going to say, so the cohort collection, so these big cohorts, the all of us, mm -hmm. the five hundred k, that can be mined for longitud longitudinally for aging, etc. Um, the good thing is that they're they're reusable. So if subjects um, consent, um, and we're getting wider consents now, um, they can be remined for multiple diseases. They can be used as control arms in trials. They speed things up in that way. And I think biology has become more of a data science. Certainly since I've been working, it, we've gone from that hypothesis-driven um, gather data to support that hypothesis to being able to gather data sets for which you can ask many questions. Um, and that's one way we're going to be able to look at ageing as a process and then the diseases of ageing and their commonalities within the same data sets. Great. I believe we also have the opportunity to open up for the panel more broadly. I was wondering, and I've heard that in the previous panel there were lots of questions, so I want to make time for the audience, so I want to make time, we leave sufficient time for that as well. Um, are there any questions to the panel? Yes. Please, let's start up there, please. Um, hello, so my name is Andrea. I'm a medical student at UCL. My question is about the diversity of data collection. So we, I think there's a general agreement and consensus that we need more diverse data. My question is, how do we get this data? So we've mentioned regulation, but a lot of data is sort of more downstream. How do we engage people from different, different ethnicities, different socioeconomic status to engage with research, healthcare, at a point where trust in medicine and healthcare is frankly a bit in free fall, so I guess. Yeah, great question. Who would like to take it? I, I think you could all take it, so. <laughs> I can start with uh, maybe, maybe one, uh, one personal kind of example, which I really uh, uh, know quite well. I mean, one, again, mentioned about <clears throat> the cohort of um, East Asian, uh, British, uh, and, and there it, it was a, a definitely a, a, a people with a low trust in, in a system. Uh, and, and, and there was a, a, a building trust on the community level. So I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a longer process. It needs, again, <laughs> a mature, but it took time to, 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 to get the, the right recruiters in, to give people understanding that they actually, the problem that you're going to explore are problems are important for the community. And they'll have a say in what diseases we prioritize to look at. So I think they kind of can really understand what will be there in there for them. And I think uh, this is very important to see about uh, uh, the bigger value for society, but also have an intermediate milestones, how, how it will be important for them, what specifically it will drive in the community, how it will make their life uh, slightly easier. Uh, again, it's not necessarily easy to communicate, but I think it, it depends on, 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 on the level and you, you need it just you cannot over communicate, so you need to do this uh, more and more. And, and reaching and, and having great examples, good examples of, of benefit will, will, will help people to, to, to bring, them, bring them in. But you cannot build, it's uh, easy to lose trust, but it's very difficult to build it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, again, you, you cannot do it over, over time, but I think as you do right things, things will, will come in and people will trust more, they'll see benefit and this will help to to really drive diverse research in, in a meaningful way, not kind of forcing people, but getting this um, into, in, into, into, into the kind of right examples. And another thing is that uh, maybe I don't want to um, kind of, 
hijack the discussion. It's using you know, innovative tools to uh, give people control on the information that they uh, they provide to the service. So some kind of, I know, I mean, I don't want to, uh, there's many solutions, but using kind of different ways of controlling the information. So people have a, have a really dynamic consent and they understand where the information is going. Now with the advent of the uh, um, informatics and, and, and digital tools, it's possible to give people a bit more freedom of how they, uh, how information is used for the genomic information, for example, the multiomics information, how that's used. So of course it will depend on the education level, but I think it's, informatics tool will enable people to click and say, yes, I agree on this study. No, I don't agree. I think this aspect of data is essential to innovation. Well, everything we do is going to be underpinned by the type and quality and diversity of data we can access. Mm -hmm. Maybe just trying to get, think of it in a, in a different way, uh, if I can ask you all a question. Um, put your hand up if you have an Amazon Prime membership, or if you have a Tesco Club card, or if you have an M&S Sparks card, or a Nectar card. Put your hand up if you don't have any one of those things that I said. Good for you. Uh, <laughs> all of you that put your hand up, do you share that data with Amazon and Tesco's and Marks and Spencer's altruistically? You share it because you get something. You get more targeted marketing of products you might want. You get 20% off next time you buy your favorite brand of margarine. You get something for sharing your data. That's why you do it. For some reason in health, we've asked people to share their data with us without making it obvious what they as an individual get back. The lady whose DNA resulted in the discovery of PCSK9 therapeutics, what did she get um, for helping that discovery? I don't know, but I'm suspecting not very much. So are there business models that we can create where people get value for sharing their data? And if you do, I'm pretty confident that people will overwhelmingly want to share their data. Now, value can be all kinds of things. It can be straight up you know, dollars. It can be cheaper medicines. It can be more medicines. It can be prediction of a disease. There's a company called 23andMe who does direct-to-consumer genetic testing. The, their business model is incredible. And you pay them to, for them to, to genotype your DNA and share your data with them. So you're giving them money and your data. And 80% of 23andMe's customers voluntarily give them money and data. So they're not getting paid for it, they're giving it to them. Why do 80% of 23andMe's customers voluntarily give their data to them? So I think we need to figure out ways of delivering value back to people mm -hmm. in return for their, their data. And that's a, and a part of the equation we currently leave out. Yeah, that's I, I, I'm not aware that it exists in health, but it does exist, the idea to kind of bring the data together and then basically those that are doing research on the get data and potentially developing products based on it have to pay those that provided the data. So the model exists, but maybe not in health. Any, does anybody know of something like that that exists in health? Um, yeah, I, I went to an accelerator in Cambridge and there was a, a startup that is working on that. So they're pulling data from individuals and then they decide what use to make that data, but they make profits from it. So you as an individual can sell your data to companies that you can identify. Mm -hmm. Very good. So are there any other questions? So maybe uh, we do it slightly differently. Let's sample three questions and then we, then we take it. So let's just share your question then we have uh, uh, yeah, two others. Yeah, for a great discussion. Um, my name's Duncan, I work for the MRC. Um, so I kind of want to maybe think a little critically about this point where you know, biology is becoming much more um, sort of data science. So one concern I have with that is we're starting to lose sight a little bit of the actual phenotype that we're dealing with. So if you look at something like, like manic depressive disorder or schizophrenia or like lupus, for instance, um, the way they're usually diagnosed is there's a list of about you know, 30 odd possible symptoms. As long as you have like a minimum five of them, you get that diagnosis. Um, and one of the issues with that is if you have a clinical trial with, say, you know, 1,000 people with manic depressive disorder, they're going to have completely wildly different symptoms. So you can do all you like about data collection, genomics, machine learning, um, but because you haven't actually necessarily thought critically about that phenotype to begin with, you're going to miss out on a lot. And to return that to this idea of value, um, that's not really about, that kind of came about not in terms of value to the patient or their carers, et cetera, 
it came out from the sort of insurance companies because that was the most kind of convenient for them to do so. And that's kind of how we sort of define these diseases often. Um, so yeah, I, I guess my kind of question to you is maybe what we need to do to think about prioritizing value is actually rethink that phenotype, not just think about the data sets. I have so a... Let me, let me, let's just sample three questions okay. so we have... A... <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Nikki. I'm a current MBA student at ESA with a PhD in immunology or immunometabolism, technically. Um, so I have two questions. They're quite divergent. And the second one, I'm not quite sure how relevant it is to what we were discussing before. But um, the first question is kind of something I was thinking about yesterday also, where we're talking about all this data collection and blah, 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 which is important. But to me, the underlying problem is if people don't go to the doctor, which is a discussion that I have with my parents all the time. Please get yourself checked. And then they're like, no, I'm not sick. It's fine, blah, blah, blah. I mean, if people don't go to the doctor, how are you going to collect this data? And I guess my question is, like, who is responsible for getting people to go to the doctor? Because I can see that companies have an, an interest. There is return there, because the more prescriptions you have in the end, the more you, know, you, can, you can make, in a way. So that's my first question. The second question, like I said, I don't know how relevant it is, but I'm very curious about drug pricing and like how this is done around the world because there's such big disparities around the world in how drugs are priced and how this is regulated. And from especially the pharmaceutical side, like, you know, I would like to understand a little bit better how we can think about this. Thank you. I think very related, yeah. So. And the third question, please. And I think, thanks for role modeling, quickly introducing yourself. Uh, that would be great if you just could quickly. Yes, in the middle. Hi, my name is Pablo. I am from the Bioentrepreneurship Program in Karolinski Institute in Sweden. And my question is actually related to your last question, is how can we expect uh, personalized healthcare to eventually uh, stream down to developing countries where probably it will take a while for them to develop. Well, at the same time, right now we're having issues of distribution of drugs uh, because I mean there are like logistical problems. I mean the, the drugs exist for the therapy for the for the diseases, but they are not reaching the, the the patients. So the next step with personalized healthcare, I mean it probably will lag even even further ahead, right? Even longer. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. So let's, let's go back to the questions and like, let me couple them. I think there are two themes that I kind of fear. The first, uh, the data and the phenotype, that also links a little bit to the definition of value and health. So in some ways the question is also the, a uh, very, this data driven or this very strong data driven uh, approach to innovation, does it force us into a focus on physical health essentially? Um, very much grounded in the genotype rather than the phenotype, so to speak. I mean, I think it's not, so first of all, I think data collection not necessarily uh, negate looking very carefully at the phenotypes. And, and, and I think it's a very important uh, uh, thing we do, it's actually actively, it's to very carefully look at the phenotypes. And there's a full realization that phenotypes are not perfect. I think Joe mentioned as well, a lot of them are based on, on, a, on a historical, uh, traditional things and not necessarily molecular phenotypes. So I think uh, we're coming from a very traditional point of Western medicine. I think things are evolving. It doesn't maybe evolve as quick as we would like, but it's definitely very careful consideration on how we systematically do it. And also there is a data approaches which can look at the multiple different features on, on a patient and try to design a better phenotype using machine learning actually. Try to design a better uh, diagnostic for, for this and kind of coming with a systematic uh, approach for phenotype creation. So this is, could help as well, uh, kind, of distil, dis, kind of distinguish this with what human will do and, and, and a doctor will do. So I think uh, those are definitely in a full, full kind of uh, full flight uh, approach. So, Joe, you also wanted to comment on that earlier. I did. Um, and this is something I've thought about quite a bit. And I think Victor um, has summarized it. Um, the phenotype is quite an, the disease description is an imprecise term, as you say, bipolar disorder, there's a grab bag of symptoms, and if you score four out of ten or whatever, doesn't necessarily mean you have the same molecular cause. 
and um, something that um, people working in knowledge graphs, for instance, spend a lot of time doing is trying to create endotypes, groups of patients who have the same molecular cause to their symptoms, which may be expressed in different ways. Um, and that's the phenotype that we need to be able to model and treat. Um, and I think the, pro the promise of this data collection is that we would be able to look at an individual person and say, OK, those are the molecular causes that I can see disrupted in you, and hence this treatment um, will be tailored to you. We actually have to understand mechanism better, I think, to be able to do that. Um, and that is the challenge of um, the data science part of biology, is to take all of this huge amount of data which we now create very easily and bring it back to molecular understanding. That we absolutely can't skip that bit, I agree. Um, but uh, there's more tools to do it now. <clears throat> Thank you. And then there was a second complex of questions around drug pricing, and particularly in the context, if I combine the cool question, if you allow me, on, let's say, personalized medicine. Because in the larger context, you know, one may say some things work very well. You know, there's a global fund that is creating access with uh, donor funding to innovations in HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis that have been innovated with higher prices originally and are now made widely available <laughs> on a generic basis. And uh, there are many uh, there are other examples going that direction. At the, the other, at the other. Uh, end of the spectrum is uh, the very personalized treatments at very high costs that are coming um, that coming through the pipeline. Um, the model for that is, is yet undefined how that is supposed to work even within countries, not only between high income countries and low middle income countries. Um, some of them are on, will only be accessible even in the US and not uh, in Europe. Um, any thoughts on this on how innovation can continue there? while at the same time thinking also about fair and equitable access. Mm -hmm. No, uh, so <clears throat> I guess my role is uh, less on pricing and, uh, and, and logistics of, uh, of drug uh, delivery, which are important. I've been in those discussions, but I'm less, less experienced, I would say, in this area. So I think from my perspective, what I should be doing is getting the right projects through because I think there was a huge attrition rate of, of the project. Because some of it, we just, we just start a lot of, if you've heard, there's a large high failure rate. And it's, it's a genuine uh, problem. We start a lot of projects which we cannot, cannot deliver because it doesn't work in, in practice. So having this attrition rate decreased and having those methods enable us to do a drug discovery at a much faster scale, a robust drug discovery in a much faster scale will eventually drive pricing down, at least I believe. Of course, this needs to be coupled with economical incentive, economic incentives and, and incentives from, uh, from different foundations to drive this, to drive this um, more broadly, not only in the developed countries. But I think this is fundamental to, to enablement of this, of this delivery. Without having this right in the beginning, the process is just too expensive, uh, um, objectively. Yeah, the, those are two really nice questions, by the way, very well articulated. The juxtaposition between precision medicine and population health, I think, is becoming more and more tense, mm -hmm. and especially in a post-pandemic world. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, you have a field of medicine that is trying to identify the most homogeneously defined, molecularly defined population that, will, that has a singular cause of a disease, and therefore you can fix that cause of the disease to treat that person. To do that, you need a very sophisticated medicine, you use sophisticated tests, and by definition, it's a small percent of the population that then get the medicine. By contrast, you have a pandemic where you want to treat everyone on the globe. So the literal opposite of precision medicine. I haven't thought of the right word of it yet, but whatever the opposite of precision is. Um, <laughs> But you see, in-precision medicine isn't right either. Yeah. So if someone comes with a good word for a kind of population health, then let me know. Um, so those two things are necessary. You need to be able to treat people so you can cure their disease when you have a singular cause of a disease. You also need to be able to prevent disease in people at a, at a population level. And they have fundamentally different business models. Another thing that was mentioned that I think is critical here is who's, who takes ownership for managing people's health and disease? So. Indeed, historically, it has been the medical profession. If you need 
medical help, you go to a doctor and or an affiliated healthcare professional, a pharmacist or an optician <coughs> or someone like that. The pandemic flipped that on its head. There's some really interesting business case studies. Um, so uh, there's a couple of websites called calm.com and headspace.com um, <coughs> whose uh, customer base went through the roof during the pandemic. They provide app-based meditation uh, products. Um, no clinical trials, uh, no doctor prescribed them, and no one told anybody you should download calm.com and do meditation. People self-decided, I believe my mental health is at risk, I think there's a product that can help me, and therefore I'm choosing to use that product. I think that ownership of who's responsible for healthcare is going to evolve. Um, my parents were dependent upon the medical sector to manage their health. I don't think you guys will be. I think you will want to take individual ownership of your health. I expect many of you are wearing things right now to track things about your health. And no one told you to do that. You chose to do that. And no one tells 23andMe customers to get their um, g genome assessed. They're choosing to do that. So I, I fundamentally believe there'll be a, a switch where people uh, will want to take ownership of their health. And that won't be the responsibility anymore of the medical profession. I think we have time for one last question. Please, over here. Um, just to give it off. What I think you need to speak into a microphone given that it's a recorded. <laughs> yes. Hi, Emil from University of Copenhagen. So uh, I kind of want to challenge uh, what you ended up on there. So how do we not end up in a situation where we are with, for example, Amazon or Facebook right now, where we just give up our very precious data and um, end up not getting anything in return? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. How do we not end up there? Because we did end up there with almost everything but health data, right? We, we gave away all our data. We gave away our buying habits, our political habits, our relationship habits. We, we, if you think about every other aspect of our life and society, we voluntarily gave it to people who then turned that back into products and gave it back to us that we then bought. Now, when it comes to health, there seems to be a different perspective there. For some reason, when it comes to our health data, we feel differently about it. And we feel like, well, that's something inherently personal to me, and therefore I don't want to just give it away. That said, many other aspects, I mean, it was mentioned about vegan typing about schizophrenia before. It's well established that your Google search history, the weeks before you have a schizophrenic episode, is very well correlated with the extent of your disease. So there are, there are all kinds of data points now that are already out there. Um, I think what's needed is the question you asked me. Uh, what is a business model uh, that provides value back to people in return for their, their health data? What do they get? Uh, do they get money? Uh, do they get cheaper medicine? Uh, do they get faster medicine? Uh, do they simply get medicine? Uh, w what is it that you get back if you share your health data? I don't know what the, the answer is, um, but I think there's something inherently different about health data than every other data we voluntarily share with people. I mean, maybe I can add something. I mean, I think it's important as well to to think about this, not in a super mercantile way. Of course, you need to get benefit, but it's part of it, you trust that you, you, you have a control and you trust that this data will not be used against you. I mean, what is the value of the, the, the young individual data, healthy individual data? For them? How, how much, I mean, there's a, many of people <laughs> like me around the globe. I mean, when young is difficult now, so how much, how do you value? Is it cents, is it dollars, is it, is it millions? However, some rare diseases, maybe where there are one uh, mutation in a very important gene highlights the function of the gene, which links to the therapy, which actually mimics the same treatment. And you can understand how your treatment will behave in, the, in, in, a real, in, a, in a real human in a longer term. It's maybe very immensely important and very, it could be hugely used uh, in, a, in, a, in a regulatory, and there's examples like this, where this type of data have been used to approve the medicine. So, but I think it needs to be done not only in an economical way, I think it's mostly about you be able to control the data rather than how much money or how much, like what the kind of purely business model I, I get for this. Of course, there should be some other things and, and th these people will should get a treatment and they will because the they underlying disease is, is explored further. So I think it needs to be more maybe kind of, kind of very complex discussion about, about, about the value there as well. Yeah. Thank you very much for the spirited discussion, Victor, Joe, Nadim. I'm not going to attempt to summarize the discussion. You can please come to the front. We are going to stick around for a moment. But like I we have been. I just want to hear a little bit from Joanna. I don't know if you don't mind. 
Um, <laughs> Please? I know what you're if saying. You can, um, can I? Is it... We can go for two more minutes. We can go for two more minutes. Would that be okay with you, Lars? Sure, I'm totally fine, yeah. <laughs> um, I think we, we talked a bit about business models, and it's, it's really about showing the, the balance between value and return we talked about before. Um, a, a company is not a moral entity, right? You have to expect them to um, benefit the bottom line. Um, that's what they should be doing, that is for their fiduciary duty. And as I talked about at the beginning, I think of companies as vehicles to do good work. All of you are going to be part of companies, of institutions, of research institutions. And it's about being able to make that creative leap between um, making value that also will benefit the bottom line. That is all of our challenge. We've done it pretty poorly in the past, especially for developing worlds, I think it's been mentioned. Um, but I think that's our challenge going forward. And as I think most of the panellists have said, um, this company here gives us hope that we'll, we'll make um, proper improvements. Thank you. Thank you.